Welcome back. I'm Max Bergman, director of the Stewart Center and Europe-Russia Eurasia program at CSIS. And I'm Maria Snigovaya, senior fellow for Russia and Eurasia. And you're listening to Russian Roulette, a podcast discussing all things Russia and Eurasia from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. and welcome back to Russian Roulette. I'm your host, Maria Snigovaya, reporting solo today while Max is on the road. Today, I'm joined by two excellent guests to discuss the recent turnover and corruption charges within the upper levels of the Russian Ministry of Defense. Why is this happening now? What does it mean for the composition of the Russian elite going forward? And how will it impact the Kremlin's ongoing efforts to expand Russian military industrial base and prosecute its war in Ukraine? Our first guest today is Michael Ziger. Michael is an independent Russian journalist, author, and commentator with a long record of examining the Russian elite, including his book, All the Kremlin's Men, which is, by the way, one of my favorites. I always have it on my bookshelf, Michael. Uh, Michael was also the founding editor-in-chief of the independent Russian news channel TV Rain. You can and should also follow Michael's writing on his Substack, The Last Spy in Year, if you want to learn all about the Russian elite. Also joining us today from Oxford, England, is Dr. Christopher Davis. Professor Davis is a professorial research fellow at the Oxford Institute of Population Aging at the University of Oxford. In addition to his work on healthcare, Dr. Davis has done extensive research into command and transition economies with significant focus on industry and defense economics in the USSR and Russia. Thank you both gentlemen for joining us today. Let's jump right in. We have a lot of topics to discuss. Michael, let's start with you. Can you please give our listeners a brief summary of the turnover allegedly taking place at the Russian MOD in recent weeks? We've seen there is a bunch of various high-level generals, commanders being arrested on often on corruption charges. What has happened and why is this happening now? What does this tell us about the war in Ukraine? So essentially, what's your take on these multiple arrests at the MOD? Hello, Maria. Hello, Christopher. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. And yes, it's very... Very interesting, and ironically, it looks like as if dead Evgeny Prigozhin and dead Alexei Navalny are striking back from their graves because Putin is doing exactly what they asked to do. Because for the last months of his life, Evgeny Prigozhin was severely criticizing the leadership of Russian Ministry of Defense and all the top Russian generals, accusing them of corruption. Actually, Navalny's team did the same. And one of the most interesting investigations about the war made by, by Navalny's team was exactly about former Deputy Minister of Defense Timur Ivanov, who was blamed for, for being a very westernized elite person whose wife had a very luxurious way of life traveling between Paris and Moscow. So never before we had any precedent where President Putin reacted to, let's say, Navalny's investigation. That's the the first time. Obviously, President Putin hasn't heard of Navalny's investigation. That's not the exact reaction. That's the reaction to the old dossiers and to all the files he's getting from from FSB. But obviously, people from FSB use the information they learned from Navalny's team, or they have it from the same sources as Navalny's team had. It tells us that Putin really takes this war seriously, and he's becoming much more psychologically obsessed with it and involved. It happens to him when he starts running the process manually on a daily basis, 24-7. And that's, that's how he runs the war in Ukraine. He's really his own minister of defense. He doesn't need Sergei Shoigu because he is running the army. He is running the minister of defense, so he doesn't need another civilian to work as his Minister of Defense. And he shows that for this time, it's not acceptable to steal under his nose. He won't tolerate army generals or former army generals to disrupt his own war. That's the beginning of this process. So Putin is essentially taking charge and he is going after allegedly corrupt army leaders at the MOD. Just for our audiences, I will sum up that there's at least uh, four arrests announced uh, recently. Uh, that's the head of the main communications directorate of the armed forces and deputy chief of the general staff, Vadim Shamarin, former commander of the 58th Army of the Russian Armed Forces, Ivan Popov, head of the main personal directorate of the Russian Ministry of Defense, Yuri Kuznetsov, and of course, deputy head of the Russian MOD, uh, Timur Ivanov. 
On top of that, we also have all this reshuffling with Minister Shoigu being replaced, and also his head of the office and press secretary have resigned. And all of his deputies as well. As well as his deputies. So pretty big deal, uh, right, against the, what allegedly looks like somewhat successful um, situation uh, on the front lines for Russia, and yet we see all this dynamic. Christopher, would you like to add something to what Michael has said? Yes. Yeah, so I view this as you might expect more from an economics point of view rather than you know, Michael is a great expert on the elite and politics. And what's clear is this is a partial replacement of the high level staff of the Ministry of Defense, particularly in areas related to economics. As you read out the names of these people, but Ivanov, substantial responsibilities for construction. Bertoletsky for procurement, you know, others working on logistics. These have all proved to be problems over the last two years. But these replacements are not a total fulfillment of what some critics of the war have called for, in that Gerasimov is still head of the general staff. It's not really addressing any problems with the high command, with officers going up involved in an operational sense. And I would just say that you have to see this in the context of the reshuffling of the economics block, as opposed to the security block, in the period since President Putin has started whatever it is, his fifth term, only in May. So Minister of Defense Shoigu is Secretary of the Security Council, but he's also head of the Federal Service for Military Technical Cooperation, which is more of a state body, and former Minister of Trade and Industry, Manturov, who I think is quite a capable administrator. I've seen him in operation when I was working on health in the COVID period with pharmaceutical industry and so on. He has been promoted to be the deputy prime minister with special responsibility for space and defense industry. And then Mishustin has been kept on, and he's head of this, this special committee meeting the needs of the armed forces. So you've got a, a team of people, and we mustn't forget President Putin, as Mikhail was saying, he plays a prominent role. He's the chairman of the Security Council, but also since 2014, he's been head of the Military Industrial Commission, which is at the heart of the military industrial complex. So he's involved in all discussions of military R&D defense, and so on. So there's, I'd say, Belarusov now coming in means that people that President Putin and his inner circle trust and have done a good job over the last two years in coping with all the challenges facing the economy are now in key positions across the whole military industrial complex and the national security elite. And just to round off, what I would expect to see is that people that Piela Usov has a chance to assess and rate highly, will probably be moved into the Ministry of Defense to take over from those uh, people that have been arrested and relieved. So that's just perhaps my difference of perspective from Michael's because of our different disciplinary backgrounds. Uh, which is what we particularly appreciate here. Just for our audiences, to, I want to flag that Shoigu was replaced with Andrei Belousov as Russian Defense Minister, as Christopher's reference. Michael, do, would you uh, would you like to comment on Chris's uh, point that really it's about the economy and it's just to sustain this war going towards this long-term, perhaps, war of attrition that suggests that essentially, again, Christopher, please correct me if I'm misinterpreting what you said, this suggests that we're essentially in this war for quite some time, and the Kremlin is preparing for fighting this for quite a while. Yes, I agree. But at the same time, in my work, I usually come to the conclusion that sometimes decisions made by the politicians and, and by the officials are not specifically logical. Sometimes they come from the psychology, from their weaknesses, from some psychological changes they, they are experiencing. Obviously, we now see that President Putin himself has changed a lot during the two years of the war. He changed his attitude to the way he runs the country. He spends 100% of his, of, of his time thinking about the war 
And the way how he reorganized the government, I think it's very symbolic. So for the first time ever, Russia doesn't have first deputy prime minister in charge of the economy. He doesn't care about uh, economy. He doesn't care about economic reforms. Obviously, there is no room for, for any new economic reforms. He thinks that basically the economy is stable. Head of central bank, Nabiulina, had done a great job. He is satisfied, more or less, where he's not ready to change the Minister of Finances, Anton Sidwanov. But he doesn't want to change anything. It's over. Those decades when he wanted Russia to become economically stronger are over. I remember the, the conversation I had with one very high profile and very high ranking member of Russian government back in 2013. And he was very sincerely confessing that, according to them, according to Putin and his inner circle, they understand that Russia is not capable to win the competition against the West just economically. If they follow the rules, they are going to lose. So the only way out was to break all the rules. The only way out was to just to turn table and the, the chessboard upside down to create the chaos. That was not a plan. That was not a strategy. That was just an approach that was very specifically formulated back 11 years ago, back in 2013, before Crimea occupation. And now we see that that has become some kind of a strategy. And, and we are in the next phase of that strategy. The economy is not, is not important. Economy should be serving to the army. Uh, the closest, the specialist on the economic reforms, who is Andrei Belousov, has to be Putin's assistant on the on the supplies of the army. And he's not going to be the real minister of defense. I think that the real minister of, the, of defense is Putin himself. He is going to be the person in charge that uh, Russian army is supplied with everything uh, it needs. I don't think that Andrei Belousov is, is going to be the real minister of defense because Putin himself is going to be the real minister of defense. Belosov is going to be his assistant in charge of making sure that the Russian army is supplied with everything it needs. And at the same time, the, the promotion of, of Denis Mantorov as the first deputy prime minister is also very symbolic. He is in charge of the industry. He is the right-hand man of Sergei Chemizov, head of Rostec, the industry man of Buddha's inner circle. So it's important that the, the government is to serve the army. That's how the system is supposed to work. So very interesting, almost discussion here between our two participants. Again, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, Michael. So it's not so much about adjusting long-term, economy long-term to these challenges that the war presents and trying to find this new balance between economy and military situation of the army, but rather it's about subordinating economy to the military needs. I think it's um, both. I'm sorry, I think it's both because it needs to be done only because of long-term perspective. Two years ago, Putin, before the invasion, Putin was not going to have the long war. But now he embraced the war. Now he understands that he needs this war. This war is the war of his li lifetime. He's not going to, to finish it until the end of his days. So yes, that's, he needs to reshuffle everything because of the long-term strategy. So Maybe if I could come in. Uh, yes, Christopher, uh, please. Yeah, just to compliment uh, what Michael is saying. If I look over the last two years, there's been a significant dynamic in development of the economy, both the civilian and war economy and the personnel. So at the start in, back in 2022, the real challenges for Russia were to cope with new very substantial economic warfare directed against it, which hadn't been practiced since the Cold War. But they also, economic policymakers, were trying to maintain stability in the civilian economy to keep living standards fairly stable. You know, as Michael knows, many child benefits, you know, pensions, all of this, because President Putin knew that in 2024, there would be another presidential election. So we didn't want too much sacrifice being imposed on the population at that time. Also, at the beginning, they thought this was going to be a limited military operation, genuinely. And it only became clear after a while that this was going to be a long-term attrition war, strongly backed by NATO and all of its military might. 
So there's been a gradual transition to a war economy, but they're not there yet. And you can see this year with defense expenditure going up from its previous low percentage of GDP of about 3% to 7 to 8%, much more of a commitment is being made. And now I think they want to make sure that these resources are being utilized properly. But I still think that efforts will be made to not impose significant sacrifices on the population economically until they really have to introduce their priority system. And they say defense highest, consumption lower. That's how I see all of these changes taking place in the economic elite. And maybe with Michael, I have a slightly different perspective because I've had a lot of experiences in Russia at the economic institutions. So, for example, Bielusov was a student at Moscow State University, 1976 to 81, and I was a postgraduate student in the faculty from 1976 to 77 in the economic faculty. So I know that it's good quality students. It's an elite university. Then he went to the Central Econo Mathematical Institute from 1981 to 86. But I went to the Central Economic Mathematical Institute in 1980 and 81 through a special US USSR Exchange of Young Economists program. Your viewers may not know it, but an academy science institute that's a bit like MIT as opposed to Oxford or Cambridge, and that it's quite technical, mathematical, statistical. And Bielorusov did very well there. He was viewed as a high flyer. And I just had a conversation with a former British economics attache who knew Bielorusov and had many meetings with him. And he's a genuinely bright, probably highly honest person, although he's been appointed to some important state committees like Rostec. And I'm sure he received legitimately a huge salary while he was there. So he's not like me as an academic. I mean, he's been well looked after. Anyway, getting back to what Michael's saying, I think it's still a bit of a mixed picture. But what you are hinting at, I think, is true that Russia is orienting itself to a long term sustained effort to improve defense industrial production, but also what Bielusov's been talking about is accelerating technological innovation, which is being demanded by this war with all the development of drones and so on. Now, Michael, like me, knows that the Soviet leadership and the Russian leadership for the last decades have been talking about the need for technological innovation. There are always some problems with it, but I think that will be one of the emphases that Bielousov and his team bring into the Ministry of Defense to try to coordinate better between the Ministry of Defense as a customer and the Ministry of Industry as a producer, and the military and research and development teams too. That's my perspective. Very interesting. So it's some sort of integration of these various strings under one umbrella of the Ministry of Defense, right, uh, Chris, as you're saying, designed to kind of push forward the technological development and also this growing militarization of the economy. It's also ongoing, right? And that's what I wanted to ask you both. It appears, based on what you're saying, that we should be expecting more changes to come then, given the fact that it's kind of a long-term process of adjustment to the challenges that Russia's economy and the Russia as a country has so unexpectedly faced, right? As you both pointed out, Putin has expected a short-term war. He actually ended up getting a long-term war for attrition. Michael, do you want to um, perhaps all Chris? Yeah. I organized a conference at Oxford in December, and there were people who were working on defense economics, but also on military issues, one of them made the point that in 2022, when things were not going well, they made a decision to shift. It's not just to attritional warfare, but it's to more of the defensive approach, the Sotovigan line, which is using the ideas of a former Soviet general Svechin about what you do to wear down your enemy in preparation for a future offensive. So the, the general staff, the military, somewhat redeemed themselves by that later shift. 
what we haven't seen yet is substantial change in the, the high command. So what Kerasimov is in charge of. And you were asking about future changes. I don't know, Michael, how rapidly do you think there'll be some changes now in the, the military apparatus as opposed to the defense management team that Usov is probably more interested in? Because that will then indicate completion of the transformation of the Ministry of Defense. Right now, it's evolving one way or the other. I do think that more changes are going to be expected, but I don't think that it's going to be fast. I don't think that, that he's got a lot of people put in charge instead of Gerasimov, and there are not, not so many people he trusts. And the fact that he's going to, to prepare for some changes, we see that he moved a very important person who is former bodyguard, then he used to work as, as Tula governor, Alexei Dumin, and now he is in Kremlin. He is sitting right next to Putin, and he is probably he's going to be the new chief of staff in several years, or could be promoted to some other position. But the fact that he, he brought back a military man, a very trusted military man, the military man who was in charge of Crimea occupation, and also he was in charge of the establishment of Wagner Group, as he was supervisor of the Wagner Group from Ministry of Defense. That person, Dumin, is going to prepare the next reshuffle in the army in, in the general staff. We see that he is slowly changing the, the team and he is relying on the people who are silent, who are very obedient, and who are much more religious. It's very in interesting to watch that habit of, of Vladimir Putin to encircle himself with a very pious people as Andrew Belosov is not only, obviously he is a very capable and very talented economist, but unlike most of his friends and most of his colleagues, he's not extremely liberal economist. He's not like Vera Nabiulina or Herman Kreff. He's not like Sergei Glazyev, also another economist who comes from the State University Economy Department. He is very super leftist economist. Belosov is right in the middle. He is very loyal, but he is famous for his religiousness. He is very religious person. He is strongly believes in God. He is the part of so of so called Diviva Brotherhood, which is there are a lot of rumors in Moscow right now about the new powers of that Diviva Brotherhood that uh, that comes from Diviva Monastery in Nizhny Novgorod region. That is some kind of religious community established by by Sergei Kirienka the person who is in charge of Russian domestic policy. And there were a lot of rumors that his situation was not so stable. He was the, the candidate for the removal, but he remained in his position. He is still in charge of the domestic policy. He, along with Andrew Belosov, he is the part of that DVA Brotherhood. And what is important, Sergei Kirilenko, now turned into a very religious person, works as some kind of Kremlin's chief personal officer. He is teaching new people. He has established so-called school of governors. He is preparing the new elite. And we saw that during the latest reshuffle, four former governors, very young governors, including Anton Alikhanov, former governor of Leningrad, who is younger than 40. He's, he's 36, I think. He is the new minister of industry. It's very important that that new team, educated and handpicked by, by Kirienka, is slowly moving uh, to Moscow. They are very, very loyal. They are probably much more religious than the previous Stenikil generation used to be. And what's important to Putin, they are not ready to give him any, any advice. It seems like Putin doesn't need to listen to anyone any longer. He wants to speak. He removed Patrushev from the position of the secretary of, of the Security Council, although it doesn't mean that Patrushev is, is not important any longer, but he is moved to much more symbolic position. Putin wants to encircle himself with younger and more loyal and more obedient people. Very fine picture you're drawing here. Michael, I just wanted to cite the quote by Putin when you mentioned about religiosity of this commerce or perhaps those who are not newcomers, but being promoted to higher position, elite members. Uh, Putin once said, like, we like martyrs, we'll go to heaven, and they, probably referencing the West, will simply die. <laughs> that is a little bit concerning, I have to say. Chris, sorry, go ahead. 
I was just going to pick up on the, the point that Michael was making. Of course, I don't know anything whatsoever about the religious dimension or the religious background. But my impression is that we've talked about the leaders of the economics block, but also there has been a fairly rapid promotion of talented younger Russian economists, political scientists, and so on. And it's important to keep in mind, I'm at Oxford, and there have been many very bright Russian economists and other academics who have been through Oxford, Harvard, LSE, and so on, starting in the mid-90s. And quite a few of these people have gone back, and they're in the ministries, they're under these people. Like, I think the analytical team at the Bank of Russia under Nabayulina is quite strong and probably also in the Ministry of Finance. Now, it could be that, as Michael's saying, a subset of these talented younger people, that they don't only just have the education, but they might have a certain religious affiliation. That's something I wouldn't know about. But it means that there's a bit of depth in terms of economic policymaking and analytical capabilities in Russia. And one has to recognize that the Russian economy has performed better than was predicted back in 2022. I remember the IMF in its April 2022 report predicted confidently that the Russian economy would collapse by 9% in 2022. But then a year and a half later, they had to change that to minus 1.2%. And they predicted that the economy would shrink by 3% in 2023 and had to revise that to a growth of 2.5%. So I think it's necessary to keep some balance about how the economy is growing and the degrees of confidence of members of the leadership at a professional level which I think objectively is reasonably good. So I wanted to flag another kind of a little bit point of dispute between our experts where Michael's pointing out how Putin is growing increasingly more personalistic and reliant on very obedient, loyal, not too perhaps independent experts and officials, right? While Chris is pointing out that despite perhaps this reality, we also see that technocrats or people on top who are ruling Russian economy at the moment actually have been able to do quite a good job. That's also a reality. And sanctions experts, unfortunately, um, have made a lot of predictions that did not come true as a result, right? Russian economy is doing better than expected. Michael, what do you say to that? Do we really see Putin perhaps doing some good job in personal selection when it comes to the economy, for example? He's maybe not so bad on that point, obedient people, but he actually does rely on their credentials. I love the fact that you want us to look like we are debating, but actually I agree. Not very with successfully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That would be fair to add that not only international institutions were wrong in uh, trying to to make a forecast about Russia's economic collapse. But Russian political elite, the Russian business elite, was also very pessimistic in the mm -hmm. beginning of the yeah. invasion. Yeah. And in early 2022, actually till the end of 2022, maybe by spring 2023, everyone were pretty much pessimistic. And we remember all those infamous and glorious uh, leaked phone calls, leaked conversations between Russian oligarchs who were totally unhappy. About All in Putin names. Happened. Yes, yeah. They were criticizing Putin and uh, all the ministers and the war. You probably, if your listeners haven't heard all those conversations, it's a pity because these were masterpieces. We really know that that was the impression. That was their mood. They were not happy with their expectations. And now it's completely different. We see the reality that the same people who used to be miserable are pretty happy now. They think that the economy is very stable. They think that they change the attitude. They change the attitude to Putin, to his decision to, to start the invasion. They were thinking that that was his fatal mistake and that would be his end. And now they see that he's okay and the Russian economy and Russian state is much more stable. They are sure that he's winning and they are supported much more. I'm trying to be in touch with uh, with as many people in Moscow and use them as as my sources. And I remember you 
businessmen who were telling me that they could not imagine themselves somehow supporting the war with anything. And now they say that, yeah, we're not sending the equipment, but we are sending some humanitarian aid and the medical assistance to the soldiers. And yeah, we changed the attitude. Actually, we are still against the war, but we think that all those soldiers, they are also the, the victims of this war. So we didn't change our anti-war position, but we changed the attitude to what is happening in the country, and we have to support the country. And after all, it's going to be very bad if Russia loses this war, because uh, it's going to be very bad for us, they say. These are completely different people from what we saw two years ago. And yes, they are much more confident in Russian economy. And obviously, they believe that it's going to be very long. The war is going to continue. I know we're probably running out of time, but I just wanted to ask Michael, since he was talking about oligarchs. I don't know any oligarchs. He knows apparently many, and he's seen them change over time. But, several, I would say. Yeah. All right. Several. But to what extent do you feel it's them being realistic about their possibilities in the world, given the economic warfare that's now being conducted against Russia, that's not just state institutional economic warfare, but it's sort of at the popular level, all of these NGOs, campaigns that undermine businesses and confiscation of properties and so on. Is it partly that they realize they can't count on a comfortable life in the West and that they're going to have to make some adjustment to reconcile themselves with uh, either life in Russia or at least investments in China or Dubai or, or something like that, in countries that the Russians consider friendly. Do you think it's their objective experiences and them observing how Russians are treated in the outside world that's making them reevaluate their trajectory in life? Yeah, I think you are absolutely right. And yes, I think that it was a huge mistake from the West to push all those people towards Putin. Because obviously a lot of Russian, not only oligarchs, but high-level businessmen or even mid-level businessmen were really shocked by the war. Some of them were planning to do it slowly. Some of them were ready to do it quickly, but were ready to move to the West and were willing not to be associated with the war, with Russia or with Putin. But for many, it became impossible. We have few symbolic figures who are the symbols of this process. For example, Oleg Tinkov, the former owner of fintech startup that has become one of Russia's most prominent online bank, who denounced the war very decisively. He had to sell his bank within two months. He had to do that. It was some kind of imposed punishment uh, from the Russian government. He was not going to be tolerated as the banker who so openly criticized the war. And even after that, even after being sanctioned by the Russian government, he was included into the sanctions by the United Kingdom. And that was the symbol for, for so many Russian businessmen who felt that even if Tinkov was the most brave, the most brave person who criticized Putin personally, even if he was sanctioned by the United Kingdom, they didn't have another choice. And a lot of people, like all, all of them, had their, their bank accounts frozen. It was not initiated by the governments. It was much more you know, compliance, different financial institutions. It was uh, banks. Western banks uh, made that decision not because they specifically probably had the, the direct order from the government. They understood that that was the right thing to do. And unfortunately, most Russian businessmen had to flee, had to go back. We had some kind of micro investment boom in Russia in 2022, because a lot of people were bringing their capitals back. And a lot of people stopped spending their money abroad. They started spending their, their money in Russia. Yeah, obviously, Dubai is the new financial capital of Russia. Yes, obviously. South of Turkey is new, south of France, and a lot of people are renting villas, not in Côte d'Azur, but in Turkey. But yes, they do regret. That's not the dream they used to have. It's not the image of the future they've been having for so many years. They wanted to live in the West, in Europe. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. make, thank you very much, Michael. I just want to keep it on time. I just want to flag that actually the sanctions were eventually lifted from Malik Tinkov. So he's fine. And also many Russian elites and rich businessmen had over 80 years to move out of Russia after 2014 happened. Yet they chose to make money in Russia. And Michael Friedman is perhaps the most notorious example of an oligarch who lived in the UK, was sanctioned. That's the Alpha Bank guy. He led and then, back to and Moscow sorry, and now sorry, he's sorry, suing. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, before that, yeah, he was sanctioned and then he was arrested for a day in December 2022. Then all the charges were lifted and he even got the compensation for the wrongful arrest in London. The point being but, that uh, he is now suing the West for sanctions without saying anything against the one Ukraine and he moved back to Moscow. So if anything, I think that confirms that sanctions were correct. Those are not the people who would ever be allies of the West. They were not willing to give up on the money that they're making in Russia. I do not it's agree. Just... I do not agree. I we'll we'll agree to they... disagree here. I just want to make this yeah. point. We need to keep that in mind. But also it takes us a little bit away from the topic of the elites to the topic of the oligarch who really are just wallets uh, who are holding Russian assets, but they don't have a lot of like certain independent action, right? So perhaps neither do the elites. But I wanted to perhaps conclude this conversation with one question to both of you. Michael, you pointed out that there's a stabilization going on in Russia. To what extent do you think these recent corruption charges and what some observers have described as even purges against this, or say for, for example, MOD, may be a little bit destabilizing for this fragile equilibrium that the Russian elites have found themselves, as you pointed out, two and a half years into this war? Do you think that corruption charges, the fact that these people are being arrested rather than just being fired, you know, as you would expect them, perhaps in a less autocratic, repressive political system, uh, may be a little bit uh, threatening to some of them? Why does it have to be arrests? Why can't it be dismissed? No, that's a very good question, because actually, if you talk to any Russian bureaucrats, they seem to be pretty much terrified. They are very tense, because the role of the prosecution and the, the general prosecutor's office has risen greatly. And they know that now everyone is watched and everyone is potentially threatened. And basic mood of of Russian bureaucracy is no one is willing to take the responsibility for anything because they are afraid of being charged with some embezzlement, fraud, corruption, accusations. That's the atmosphere in, in Russian bureaucracy, which has become much more passive and apathetic than it used to be. And at the same time, we we have seen a lot of very strange cases with Russian prosecution. For example, last year, the leading food producer, the company that was producing pasta in Russia, a company named Makfa, was charged with 100 trillion rubles. They were accused of tax fraud for 100 trillion rubles. That's an amazing amount of money. It's a fantasy. That's like triple size of the GDP of Russia. Actually, the objective was just to take the company from the owners and to find some new owners for that property. And that's the process. That's what's happening. Everyone knows that. Uh, Um, Many thanks, Michael. Yeah, Chris, anything to add to that? Yeah, just in conclusion, I think there have been significant personnel turnovers in the Ministry of Defense, as we've discussed, and also other cases that Michael's saying. And there are many people in the Russian government who undoubtedly are vulnerable if suddenly the prosecutor says, my goodness, you accepted a bribe, and they might have known this for 10 years. But the impression I have from President Putin coming in for this new term is that there's a certain emphasis on stability, and there is some turnover in key places. But right at the moment, it's not getting out of control the way let's say it did back in the Stalin period or some other episodes in Russian history. But that always could change just because there are vulnerabilities. This perhaps is the best way uh, to conclude our today's conversation. It was very interesting and certainly dynamic. Clearly, there's a lot more to say in the topic. So Chris and Michael, at some point, I'll be happy to welcome you back to our podcast. But as of now, we'll have to end it there. Clearly, there appears to be some sort of a fragile balance you found in the Russian elites, but it's very likely that this balance will not survive. So there'll be more to talk about for us. But I wanted to stop here by offering a big thank you to Christopher and Michael for joining us today. And of course, another thank you to our listeners for tuning in. And as usual, if you haven't already, please subscribe to our show and give us a five-star rating. 
And please also check out our sister podcast, The Europhile, wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. You've been listening to Russian Roulette. We hope you enjoyed this episode and tune in again soon. Russian Roulette releases new episodes every two weeks on Thursdays and is available wherever you get your podcasts. So please subscribe and share our episodes online. And be sure to check out all the latest analysis by the Europe, Russia and Eurasia program at csis.org.